friends a very good morning to all the audience myself miss palak karya phd research scholar i will be the moderator for today's session and i welcome all of you for this insightful session on hplc and lcms empowering multidisciplinary research dear all it's indeed an honor for me to welcome our respected principal madam dr supriya shidhay ma'am our principal madam dr supriya shidhay madam has an overall professional experience of 29 years and research she has received a total research grant of 1 crore 26 lakhs and 43000 us dollars till date from various government and private bodies such as aict university of mumbai biotechnology brns ignition birag university of central lancashire preston uk science and engineering research board janssen pharmaceuticals belgium sepic national innovation foundation isha therapeutics emami work special private limited and ex many others our principal madam has 58 review and research publications in various national and international journals madam has four patents published out of which two are granted to her credit madam was the chairperson of board of studies in pharmacy university of mumbai from 2019 to 2022 our principal madam is a member of research recognition committee of university of mumbai facility research of m farm and phd tech level we are fortunate to work under such a dynamic principal madam madam is also a certified yoga instructor from the ayush government of india she has recently received diploma in yoga i welcome our principal madam to speak a few inspirational words and uh, speak about our college thanks palak for that kind introduction on behalf of vs college of pharmacy i welcome our eminent speaker of the day dr ajit datar scientific advisor clarity biosystems india private limited and shimadzu analyticals india private limited i welcome the august gathering of teaching staff and students for this webin seminar webinar uh, i would like to really congratulate the team of uh, hods and faculty members of vs college of pharmacy for having thought of this research connect series as an initiative from vs college of pharmacy so the objective of this webinar or this research connect series that we have been delivering since last one month is just to bring all undergraduate students or graduated students on one basic level of understanding of knowledge and skills in various fields of pharmacy which is drug discovery formulation development analytical method development pharmacognosy so on and so forth we believe that such kind of foundation that we are trying to create through this research connect would help students to take their research to the greater levels talking about vs college of pharmacy our focus is always to create a very efficient research and development ecosystem which also fosters innovation and entrepreneurship so with this agenda in mind right from day one we have been working very hard and today when we are in the 16th year of our establishment we are proud to have our masters program in pharmaceutics quality assurance pharmaceutical chemistry and phd programs in pharmaceutics and quality assurance and uh, we are equally proud to be affiliated with university of mumbai for delivering all these post graduate programs and phd programs we also have the advisory board our research advisor professor mangal nagar senkar madam industrial advisors and the state of the art infrastructure created for conventional formulations nano formulations and their advanced analytical method developments have given at least a good background and good facility for our students to do some meaningful research 
which is getting translated into some awards like avishkar a championship trophy the aict cii award for best industry linked institutions good ranking among top 125 institutions by nira and nac ranking with a plus grade at 3.46 cgpa so uh, uh, our humble attempt is to keep our research students motivated and inspired with the talk of luminaries like dr ajit data who has accepted kindly accepted our invitation to be a resource person for a topic of hplc and its application so uh, when nep 2020 talks about multidisciplinary research i think each of the research scholar should know in depth how to develop hplc method and more importantly how to apply it for various purposes including stability testing bioanalytical testing or impurity profiling or any other standardization procedures so there is that there, there cannot cannot be anybody as eminent as dr ajit data who has expertise and uh, the entire lifetime experience in this field of analytical method development and its application so without taking much of time of all our audience i would request uh, our uh, coordinator palak to take the proceedings ahead and we are eagerly waiting to hear from dr ajit dada thank you all of you thank you madam for your inspirational words and setting the tone for today's webinar now i welcome our dr anita aire ma'am head and department of quality assurance associate professor to introduce the speaker of the day dr ajit datar sir thank you palak uh, it is indeed an honor and privilege for me uh, to introduce today's speaker uh, dr ajit datar sir who has a plethora of experience when it comes to analytical research especially uh, the science and the principle as well as lcms we were fortunate to listen to few of uh, sir's uh, sessions in earlier seminars and sir really thanks a lot for accepting our invitation uh, so dear audience uh, to introduce you to dr ajit datar sir sir has received his msc in 1971 and phd in 1976 from university of mumbai he was the recipient of department of atomic energy fellowship in 1971 and carried out his phd research from the analytical chemistry division of barc he is associated with msc course in bioanalytical sciences since 2004 for the development of syllabus and teaching since it was introduced at mumbai university he covers the topic of analytical instruments for bioanalysis by having about 100 lectures per year he was a visiting faculty for the diploma course on industrial analytical chemistry at ruia college from 1994 to 2007 sir is also a visiting faculty at several colleges in mumbai and he has several publications in his name and was a guide for the phd students at mumbai university and a guide and he has guided total 8 students in the period from 2009 to 2017 talking about his industrial experience and the industrial career sir has worked with shimadzu analytical india private limited mumbai in customer support center from 2007 to 2020 his main job profile was to provide instrumental analysis support to customers and to provide training prior to shimadzu he was with thermo electron and served the organization as a general manager in the advanced mass spectrometry department He was responsible for promoting advanced mass spectrometry products of Thermo Finnegan in India. He retired in 2007 after completing 58 years of vast experience in the industry. He served for Kromlin Instruments Company and IR Technology as a technical director and a senior manager respectively for a period of 15 years. His first assignment was with Central Research Station of Associated Cement Company Limited, popularly known as ACC, as a research officer, and he served years from 1986 to 88. At present, Sir is working as an advisor for Borosil Borosil Limited. He was with Borosil from January 2020 to June 23, 
and at present he is working as a scientific advisor to clarity biosystems india private limited as well as shimadzu analytical india private limited sir it is indeed an honor for us to have you with us today i now request sir to take over the sir, take over the stage and deliver a talk on how hplc as well as lcms can be exploited for their diverse ap applications when it comes to multidisciplinary research so over to you datar sir thank you thank you very much for your kindness i hope uh, my voice is clear it is not yes, too loud sir, yes. and yeah okay that's yes, good yes. and uh, th 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 my presentation is on the screen and yes sir yes verify that yeah yeah is ict team can you now? confirm if the screen is presenting hello yes sir are you able to see the presentation it is presenting madam it is seen it is yes, it is yes seen, over no? to okay. you sir okay. yeah thank you so much again and thanks for your very kind words and it is indeed my pleasure to be associated with uh, vivekananda education society's uh, college of pharmacy i, I was uh, thinking about this association for a long time but uh, it has happened now so i'm very happy about that uh, i've been watching the progress of this institute for last several years and uh, facilities which you have created are really very wonderful for the students of the uh, not only for college of pharmacy but even for the other departments okay so uh, let me now continue with the topic which has been given to me that is diverse applications of hplc and cms in the pharmaceutical research it's a very vast topic i have just about 40 45 minutes to cover it okay but then uh, probably there will be some questions answers after the end of the topic so i will keep some 10 minutes uh, 10 to 15 minutes for that so that uh, the doubts can be clarified uh yes so let me proceed now with uh, the topic as such uh i always uh, try to uh, give lecture using a friend of mine so probably initially of course uh, i will start with him so he is a friend of mine okay so you can see he is uh, a juggler playing with some objects standing on a platform with gyratory motion and it's very difficult task okay so who is he he is nothing but the analytical chemist okay so uh, analytical chemist has really uh, to play with some uh, important terminologies one is sensitivity other is selectivity separation structure and speed these are five s which are very very critical in analytical chemistry. and then if he has to manage to play with these terms there is something which he has to suppress there is possibility of some errors which can uh, create some problems in any kind of analysis especially when you want to achieve a particular sensitivity so there could be a sampling error it could be a, a proper pick up of the sample or the preparation of sample by itself how do you do the extraction how do you collect your sample does it represent the bulk so all those factors come in sampling error there is always a background which is given uh, when you start working with any instrument there is always a background which, which we call as uh, the shift in the baseline because of the background so this background can also block your signal so the background needs to be suppressed and there is always a noise associated with uh, any kind of instrument and that is why we use the term signal to noise ratio when we talk about the instrument so signal to noise ratio is very important and to have good signal to noise ratio we have only two alternatives one is to reduce the noise or otherwise to increase the signal which is not always easy to increase the signal level but you can definitely try to control the noise level so that the signal to noise ratio will be very good so this this is the uh, kind of a start of I mean, which i do because i want to make sure that uh, you understand the concepts of analytical chemistry with this slide and what is more important here is that the when you look at all the terminologies sensitivity selectivity separation there are lots of uh, uh, techniques which can be used for separation but the one technique which is most important is the chromatography so we are going to talk about that 
then many times we require to find out the structure. Chromatography cannot give you the structure information. So you require techniques like mass spectrometry or NMR or IR, etc. And mass spectrometry is one of the best techniques which can give you this sensitivity and selectivity. And that is why the structural uh, in interpretation or structural information is very, very important. Another factor is speed of analysis. And let me tell you that the combination of mass spectrometry with liquid chromatography or with GC definitely gives you a lot of speed. Uh, chromatography can definitely give you separation, but the mass spectrometry also adds to that. So separation can be possible by mass spectrometry also. So when you have a combination of LC and MS, you have much more advantages. It is not just 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. It is 1 plus 1 is equal to 11. So these techniques really, when they are combined, I call them as a marriage of convenience. We are going to talk a little bit, few slides on LCMS because LC itself will take a lot of time. Okay, so let me proceed further. Let me go to the next slide. Hello. Uh, yeah. So let us talk about evolution of HPLC. DuPont and Waters manufactured HPLC around 1965 and it was then called as high pressure liquid chromatograph. With uh, special packing materials with the bonded phase uh, or reverse phase chromatography and with uh, much better detectors, the, the uh, term pressure is slowly out of it and we started calling it as a high performance liquid chromatography. Then P doesn't stand now for pressure but it stands for performance and that is how HPLC term has come. We, we call it as high performance liquid chromatography. The performance really improved a lot after somewhere around 1980s or 90, around 1980s or 1990s. Yeah, this is the, the old book on uh, liquid chromatography. Now probably is not available, but I have gone through this book and this book had a cartoon on the front page, which which uh, tells you a uh, cartoonist view of looking at liquid chromatography or HPLC. Okay, so you can see the pump, you can see the sample introduction, you can see the column can see the detector and the data system to draw the chromatogram. Okay, so this is the simple low pressure gradient system where we call as quaternary gradient system, which is the one which is most popular. There are of course other systems like binary gradient and gradient, etc. But the most popular system is quaternary gradient system. Okay, where we have only one pump, but which can control the the flow from four different solvents with a proper valve and you can mix any solvent out of ABC in whatever proportion you want and you can achieve a good uh, mobile phase which would be able to separate the uh, components which are introduced through the injection device and uh, the, the good advantage of uh, liquid chromatography over gas chromatography is that that gas chromatography has a carrier gas. It is not called as a mobile phase. It just carries the sample from the injection port through the column to the detector. It doesn't really take part in separation. While liquid chromatography has great advantage that the mobile phase takes part in separation because it can definitely have a partition really happening. Uh, and the, uh, the, the solvation property of the mobile phase really takes part in uh, the separation phenomena. Okay, so that is why the mobile phase really is very, very important in HPLC. Yeah, can, can I go to the next slide? Yeah, so chromatography has the analytical, it is a high sensitivity purification and isolation, uh, which is uh, basically used for that. There are also semi preparative and preparative liquid chromatography, I've given below the table roughly indicating which is used for analytical, which is used for a preparative purpose. And many times this preparative LC also is equally important because by using preparative liquid chromatography, you can collect your impurities and stop the impurities to the higher level and then characterize the impurities in a pharmaceutical uh, product. Okay, so the uh, liquid chromatography with preparative attachment or preparative scale is very very important in many many applications so we are not only looking at the analytical chromatography many times the preparative chromatography is also equally important 
Uh, in pharmaceutical research, we use uh, liquid chromatography for several applications. One is uh, drug development, impurity analysis, metabolite identification, DAB studies, formulation research, quality control of API and drug products, stability studies, and even in some cases, we do therapeutic drug monitoring. Okay, so these are some of the areas where the uh, HPLC is used. We are going to consider some of them, not all of them. Uh, we'll try to cover one by one some of these aspects of uh, uh, applications of HPLC. Yeah, so these are the kind of columns which we use lengthwise and the pressure wise and you can see there are columns which are coming which are below two micron particle size and, and the pressure really goes very very high and uh, we, we are going to talk about what we call as UPLC to some extent. We have a lot of choices here. We have a lot of choices of columns. We have a lot of choices of temperature also. We can increase the temperature up to depending upon the application of 250 degrees column temperature. We can use guard columns for uh, I mean, uh, preserving our analytical column from any kind of a matrix if it is not really uh, not very good matrix, especially biological matrix, etc. These are the sort of applications of LC with respect to the column, with respect to the molecular size, with respect to the polarity of the molecule. So you can see there are there are two branches. One is below thousand or below 1500 molecular weight and many of them are above 1500 or above 2000 molecular weight where we use what we call a size fusion chromatography either in gel permeation or gel filtration form and we can also use ion exchange uh, and your phase for some of the molecules which are uh, larger in size while in most of the cases with the small molecules we use either River phase or normal phase uh, chromatography. Uh, when the compounds are generally organic soluble, we use river phase to some extent. Uh, uh, not no more of a normal phase, but in some extent even river phase chromatography. And for water uh, soluble compounds, we generally use the uh, uh, river phase chromatography. And sometimes very highly coded compounds, we use a different uh, kind of chromatography with highly columns. And uh, those are also used in some of the applications where we have very highly polar samples. Uh, these are some of the columns when we talk about high performance liquid chromatography. So generally, uh, everybody knows uh, the kind of columns which we have. So we have a river phase columns. We have iron pair uh, method for analysis uh, where we can use C18 and C8 columns again. Then we use normal phase, like hexane kind of a solvent for a lot of uh, non-polar samples. We use ion exchange chromatography for ionic compounds, and we use for high molecular weight size exclusion chromatography. Uh, there are when we talk about C18 as one of the columns, there are lots of varieties of C18 columns. So C18 itself is uh, octadecyl silane kind of a river phase, uh, bonded phase, what we call as column. But there are several varieties of C18 with some sort of variation which makes it applicable for various uh, different areas. And there are various manufacturers of uh, C18 column. Those uh, say their columns are better for certain applications. And uh, people really uh, find them very useful when they decided they on the basis of the uh, published literature from these manufacturers, one can choose a proper column uh, which is suitable for a particular application. So even in C18, there are lots of varieties. Similar thing could be also for C8. Okay, but C18 is the most uh, widely used column. So when we buy a C18 column, we have to be very clear for what applications we are buying that column. So two columns of C18 may not exactly perform uh, identical okay so one has to be very careful when he chooses a column uh, depending upon the areas of application so we are going through quickly some uh, applications of hplc and uh, i will go through this slide quickly, quickly so that uh, you already know uh, some of the things about the 
use of HPLC. This is anti inflammatory yeast which can be analyzed by HPLC. Conditions are given below, but I am not going to read everything. Uh, basic drugs can be analyzed. You can just quickly go through the names which are written there. Then we can have antidepressants which can be easily analyzed by HPLC, which is one of the areas, then benzodiazepines uh, and metabolites. So, especially in uh, pharmaceutical uh, research, the metabolites play a very, very important role. We talk about ADME, where metabolites, M stands for metabolites, and we talk about drug metabolites. So, when we consume a drug, the, the drug gets converted or it gets metabolized in the uh, body fluid and forms a different kind of compounds. And these compounds could have therapeutic value or they could be also toxic. So it becomes very necessary to analyze all the metabolites of any new chemical entity. And you can have various methods. You can use in vitro methods or in vivo methods. But of course, firstly, you try with in vitro methods to find out which kind of metabolites get formed, whether they are, they can be structurally identified and whether their toxicity can be also studied by using uh, some kind of uh, in vivo techniques. So you, you have to have uh, the analysis of all the metabolites, almost all the metabolites, which are uh, possible by using a particular drug. So metabolite studies are very, very important. This is again another one, morphines and metabolites. And many times, so, uh, these kind of metabolites are very much required to be studied because uh, the main drug after consumption uh, doesn't remain in the body fluids or in the urine or plasma, but the metabolites may exist. So especially when any kind of abuse drug uh, needs to be analyzed, uh, if somebody is under the influence of a drug, it can be also studied by analyzing the metabolites of that drug. So it is very important to analyze the metabolites. This is antihistamines and excipients, which can be analyzed by using the HPLC. Steroids can be definitely analyzed by HPLC. Antibacterials. Process control of chiral compounds. Okay, so in, uh, many times uh, it is very important that there are a lot of chiral drugs and uh, in some cases both the racemic forms are useful, but in many of the applications, you either find R form is having a good therapeutic value compared to S form, or is one of the form is very high therapeutic value, other form is absolutely zero value, or it is it could be even toxic. In that case, you have to only manufacture a particular form. And in that case, uh, you have to have a good chiral separation. And in many times, uh, to have a particular form rather than to have a racemic mixture, it is always better to use a preparative LC to separate these and collect the fraction which you require. And instead of trying to produce synthetically one form, which is very uh, kind of a costly process, rather than to have a racemic form and use a good preparative uh, LC to uh, collect the particular form of interest. So there are preparative LCs which can work at a, uh, grams or kg levels and which can definitely separate the forms of your interest by using the uh, chiral preparative LC systems. This is additives in mobile phase. As I was talking that uh, mobile phase is very, very important. Here I have given an example where by using the reverse uh, phase chromatography, uh, there is uh, no possibility of, uh, I mean, the peak of this particular compound uh, is not able to be seen at all. But when you add 0.1% uh, of DEA, because this is an amine, uh, the addition of DEA uh, makes it come out from the column very easily. And you can see the separation of these two compounds just by adding 0.1% DEA. So modification of mobile phase can create a much better kind of a separation. Otherwise, probably it would have taken very long time or it is not even seen at all. But then when you have a small addition of DEA in the mobile phase, 
you are able to get a good separation. Polyphenolic flavonoids, I mean, when you are working with uh, medicinal plants or natural products or uh, phytoconstituents need to be separated, then you require to have a method, uh, HPLC method, which can separate the flavonoids from the uh, medicinal plants or from any kind of a plant extract which needs to be, I mean, that is the, one of the research area where people are working uh, uh, today and especially a lot of pharmaceutical colleges are, are working in this area and we have a lot of uh, rich resources available around uh, even in the Sanyadri hills you will find plenty of uh, uh, plants which are still to be uh, looked into and uh, there is a lot of research scope available on many of these hardly 10 to 20 percent of the plants have been exploited and there are lots of them are still waiting for and one doesn't know we can get some uh, good medicine or good active ingredient from any of these plants which can be able to be used for uh, some of the uh, very important or very uh, fatal diseases this is oligomers from corn syrup and just some, some of the beverages additives and you can see here uh, in some of the cases uh, we have used a detector which is evaporative light scattering detector okay, so we'll talk about that because these are some of the areas which we have to look into because not only columns not only the mobile phase which plays a role in uh, the applications of hplc but many times the detectors also are very critical about uh, the areas of application. So ELST is one of the detectors which is uh, uh, replacing the uh, refractive index detector in many areas. And it is more sensitive than many times UV detector as well as uh, any of the refractive index detectors. So evaporative light scattering detector is uh, sort of a universal detector for uh, many of the compounds and it works with very well with sugars and alcohols and those compounds which have no chromophoric group and uh, you can't use a uh, visual detector there but yeah this is beverage additives again and this is done by uv detector to some extent because it has benzoic acid and saccharines and some of those which have a uh, uv absorbance this is protein mix now a lot of uh, new drugs are coming which are uh, protein based drugs so we call them as uh, biopharmaceuticals and where you need to analyze proteins by using HPLC and here of course uh, you can see the uh, size exclusion chromatography is used with uh, TFA as the mobile phase and you can separate proteins. Similarly, uh, peptides, again, the peptide-based drugs are also coming up and you need to analyze peptides. And again, by using C18 column, you can analyze peptides. And this is again a special column for uh, separating peptides. Nucleosides are separated by using again uh, uh, HPLC with C18 column. And, uh, this is one of the areas, nucleotides, nucleosides can be separated by using HPLC with C18 models. Now coming to the uh, detector's specificity and the importance of detectors in diverse applications of HPLC. This is one uh, slide where I'm showing amino acids. This is uh, derivatives of amino acids which are separated and a UV detector is used after derivatization and this is the kind of a chromatogram you get for about 21 amino acids. Now I'm showing you next slide where uh, I'm using the same kind of a amino acid, same amino acids, but now I'm using a fluorescence detector. And with fluorescence detector, I'm able to achieve much higher sensitivity. Now the chromatogram which you are seeing here by UV detector, when you compare it with fluorescence, it is at the bottom. Okay, so there are two chromatograms there, one with very tall peaks, and there is other one which is uh, just uh, below that, 
which is the UV chromatogram and the other one is the fluorescence chromatogram. So you can see the uh, selectivity of fluorescence or the kind of sensitivity which you can achieve by fluorescence detectors. So that's the kind of advantage you get because there are diverse detectors which are available. And uh, you can, by choosing a proper detector, you can achieve the uh, desired results with uh, desired kind of sensitivity. Yeah, there is a photodiode array detector and uh, that's a very common detector now used. Okay, so instead of UV detector, people are moving towards uh, a diode array detector. In diode array detector, what happens is uh, we do not require a monochromator. We do not measure the absorbance at individual wavelengths and select the wavelength at which the particular compound gives a lambda match. So we select a wavelength on the basic one wavelength where most of the compounds in a given mixture are absorbing at that wavelength, and you can get a, a good chromatogram with uh, good um, concentrations and good intensities. But the the advantage of photodiode array is that uh, instead of uh, using one wavelength, you can have all the wavelengths passing through the sample, and you have the uh, absorption measured at individual wavelengths. So. You have a grating, which is of course required, but the polychromatic radiation falls on the grating, which is coming through the sample. You get dispersed, and there are so many diodes which are arranged. There is an array of photodiodes. Uh, there are, in this case, there are 5 and 12 photodiodes. You can have even 10, 24 photodiodes located on a small strip of about one inch in length, and where uh, all those diodes individually get one wavelength, and you can get simultaneously the information about the chromatography and about the spectra of a compound. You get a chromatogram something like this. So we can call it as a spectrochromatogram. On one axis, the red one is the chromatogram and the black one is the spectrum. So one axis is a time axis, is a wavelength axis. And you can then get information about the spectra of a compound. And that is very, very useful. So simultaneous information about the chromatogram as well as spectra can solve many of the problems. Okay, so the problem can be related to finding out. So you can see in colored vision uh, by using the software, you can see the uh, information in three dimensions like this. So one axis is the time axis, other axis is the wavelength axis, and you can see as the peak eludes. Uh, you can see the uh, spectra as well as the chromatogram and at every uh, at, at, on many points on the peak as the peak starts eluting you get the spectral information and that is very useful because it can talk about the peak purity so if the peak is not pure you can definitely find out the uh, peak purity so when you look at the peak if uh, if you can take a spectrum at many points on the peak and if the spectra looks identical on all the points on the peak starting to the end so generally we measure five points on a peak at something like 10 percent height 50 percent height top of the peak again 50 percent height as the peak uh, both the sides ascending and descending side and 10 percent again so uh, these five uh, spectra if they are identical we, if, uh, the peak con is considered to be pure but if there is some indication of some kind of impurity on a tail of a peak, then you can see the spectra looks different as you can see here. Standard and sample has a variation and you can definitely conclude that the peak is not pure and it has some impurity hidden inside, which you may not be able to see because it is a coeluting kind of impurity and the main peak is masking the peak which is uh, the peak because of impurity. There is an electrochemical detector which is very sensitive for amines and many compounds which can be oxidized or reduced and here is one example of catecholamines and uh, related compounds which are separated by normal chromatographic method but then what you have is an electrochemical detector which is very sensitive to catecholamines or amines in general and you can mine all these compounds these are very useful compounds especially for neurological studies and you can you must have read about the importance of some of these uh, 
compartment, dopamine, in the behavioral state, etc. So uh, these catecholamines are very, very important, especially for the treatment as well as for understanding the uh, many of these uh, amines in the samples. Okay. So uh, these are this is the uh, detector which is conductivity detector which is used for anion okay or cation or ion exchange chromatography. So again this is a specific detector which gives some kind of a diversity and it can measure many of these uh, uh, anions. Now here the example is of anion. And they can be measured by using ion exchange column. So column is different, the detector is different, and you will be able to have the diversity because of that. Uh, the advantage is that you can have a conductivity detector and a PDA detector in series. Now, which can definitely give you some information, especially if uh, the, uh, the uh, particular detector is good for uh, particular type of compounds. Now you can see PDA detector would be good for compounds which can give a chromophoric, uh, as a chromophoric uh, groups, then there would be absorbance, while the conductivity detector would be able to sense the ionic compounds. Okay, so you can differentiate between ionic compounds and the compounds within the ionic compounds which also can have a chromophoric group. So as, as you can see here, the compound number three which is uh, nitrile and the compound number four which is shown as a little peak here but which is uh, nitrite and nitrate and there is also one peak which is five uh, sorry yeah five which is uh, the uh, no sorry the three four and five are showing bromide is also there which are showing their problems in the pda detector also then there is uh, this detector, which is, uh, as I mentioned, evaporative light scattering detector, which is a very good detector for the, uh, which is uh, what we call a universal detector, uh, where you have this uh, solvent nebulized along with the air or nitrogen, and the small drops of solvent along with your sample uh, gets out from the nebulizing gas, and then the solvent evaporates uh, very fast and the larger uh, uh, com the size compound of uh, your sample, larger size molecules of your sample, they come in the way of uh, the radiation which is a laser light source and gets scattered and you have a detector on the other side at somewhere around 90 degrees to the, uh, the uh, source of radiation, laser radiation and any scattered light is measured. So whenever you have a sample coming out, you will be able to see the radiation coming through the detector. And that is the indication of a peak which is eluting out from the column. The advantage is that the solvent molecules get vaporized and they go up. They do not show any kind of a, a peak and uh, you will not be able to see a peak because of solvent. You will only be able to see the peak because of your compound. Uh, the spectra here, oh, sorry, I'm going back. Yeah, okay. No, okay. This is uh, the example of uh, sugars. Now, sugar analysis is one of the important analysis. And here you can see beer sugars analyzed by using ELSG detector. And it is quite sensitive. So, you can do this analysis by refractive index also. And you can do this analysis by using ELSG also. You can see here the main difference between the two. Now here the ALSD detector is used uh, for the analysis and you can see some of the sugars here. But one major difference is that you can see the sensitivity of the ELSD which is new one is much higher compared to the other one which is uh, with refractive index detector. And refractive index detector shows a peak because of solvent mobile phase. So you can see a, a broad peak before at the lower uh, lower time, lower retention time, which is because of the solvent. While you do not see that peak at all in case of an ELSD detector because it doesn't sense the, uh, the solvent which has got no molecules, uh, larger size molecules which can be measured by using the uh, ELSD 
detectors. So solvent just evaporates and goes as a gas molecule, while the the sol sample molecules are larger in size and they will come as a, uh, particles and the uh, laser light will be able to get scattered by those and can be detected. So that's the great advantage of having the ELSD as one of the detectors for such samples. Then we come to LC and UPLC or UHPLC. So earlier days when uh, we started HPLC with uh, 4.6 millimeter uh, diameter column uh, and the 5 micron particle size, the normal pressure which was required, I mean the pump used to have 6000 psi pressure capacity, but normally the pressure which was uh, going up to something like 2000 psi. And uh, those kind of columns, uh, which is uh, 25 centimeter or 30 centimeter in length, and then coming uh, down to something like 150 millimeter, 150 uh, uh, millimeter length or 15 centimeter in length, those kind of columns were very popular for very, very long time. But in 2004, people thought of having the columns with uh, much smaller diameter. So started with sub 3 micron, came down to sub 2 micron columns. Now we are talking about 1.7 or 1.6 micron column. And where the pressure can go to, because of the particle size being very small, the, the normal 6000 PSI pumps are not sufficient for such applications. So we require to have a, a pumps which are 15,000 PSI or above that. So the pressure has gone almost uh, two to three times higher than the previous columns. Uh, earlier days when we had 6000 PSI uh, pumps and uh, the, the uh, connections which were used at that time, uh, many a times we used to face problems uh, because of leakages. And we used to uh, call it as a high pressure leaking chromatography. But then nowadays, of course, with such a high pressure, the systems are made so good, the connections are so nicely made, the, the uh, mechanical uh, devices or the uh, components which are so nice that even at such a high pressure, you don't find any kind of leakages. The advantage of this ultra high pressure liquid chromatography is that now you can achieve the separation much faster. Remember there is one punch line for a chromatography. The punch line for chromatography is that to achieve a good separation in less time. Okay, so we are always looking, our pharma industry always looks for high throughput analysis. Can we do this analysis in a shorter time? And for that, they are ready to pay more. So uh, if the analysis can be achieved at much less time compared to the normal HPLC, people would definitely prefer uh, ultra high pressure or UPLC kind of a technology. So let us look at the, the particle size evolution or evaluation. So you can see uh, this is the uh, Van Dinter's plot, which you are aware of. Theoretically, you have studied this. Uh, when you have uh, the HPLCs, which are above 5 micron, 10 micron, which were before 1970s, then the Van Dinter curve was looking something like this, the top one here. Then we have 5 micron particle size, which we use for very, very long time. And then the particle size started coming down to 3.5 micron to 1.7 micron, etc. And you can see there is a shift in the uh, Van Dinter's equation. Now you can see the Van Dinter's equation does not show the minimum. Here you can see there is a minimum uh, value of H. And remember that when H is minimum, the column efficiency is higher. So we want H -E to be, H -E -T -P to be lower so that the column efficiency can be higher. So you can see one thing as you are uh, particle size is decreasing, your H value is decreasing. That means column efficiency is increasing. Apart from that, there is one more advantage that as you go down to 1.7 micron column, uh, you have one advantage that the line becomes almost parallel. That means even if you increase the linear velocity, because the plot is uh, the HETP against the linear velocity. So even if you increase the linear velocity, 
there is no change in the H value. So uh, the H value almost remains same. What does it mean? The column efficiency remains same. That means it doesn't affect the separation. And you can have a faster elution time. So the time gets reduced and without compromising on the H value. So that is the great advantage of the uh, ultra high pressure liquid chromatography. You can see here one chromatogram which is shown here with a normal uh, ODS column which is 4.6 millimeter ID, 150 millimeter in length. And you can see the separation is taking something like 25 minutes. And with 1.8 micron column, in 50 millimeter length, so the length is only 5 centimeter compared to 15 centimeter. Pressure, of course, is very high compared to 5.4 megapascals, it is uh, 105 megapascals, so quite high pressure. And you can see the separation is happening in 0.6 or less than 0.7 minutes. So, where is uh, 15 minutes and where is 0.7 minutes? And you can see there is no compromise on the resolution factor. So you can see the total uh, plate number is uh, uh, in the first case total plate number appears to be uh, 11,352 and here it is the uh, 6,634 but if you look at the resolution in both the cases the resolution is around 4.5 okay so the resolution is 8.4 uh, the resolution between four is 8.4 and by a resolution is 10.8 what is required is we want minimum resolution is 1.5 here the resolution is still very high the flow rate is little high 1.8 ml per minute compared to 1 ml per minute but the advantage is that the uh, the time saved so instead of waiting for about 20 minutes for separation able to do this so that's the great advantage of having uh, ultra high speed chromatography i'm giving you one more example here where something like uh, 244 peaks are compounds are separated in eight minutes because of ultra high uh, pressure liquid chromatography okay and i can give you one more example you can see here three different injections and all these three injections of something like seven different compounds are finished within uh, two minutes. So each of these uh, seven compounds are separated less than 0.5 minutes, all the compounds. Second injection is done, another 0.5 minutes. Third injection is done, another 0.5 minutes. So something like, uh, something like two minutes, you have finished the injections and without compromising on any kind of a resolution. So that's the advantage of ultra high pressure liquid chromatography and that uh, serves the purpose of getting a good separation in less time. Nowhere separation is compromised for the time. That is very, very important. So you have to achieve a separation in less time. So when Yeah, dear participants, please note uh, we are having some issue with uh, our speakers and we are trying to resolve it at the earliest. Kindly uh, be present. Connect with sir.
Hello. Am I seeing? Hello. Yes, Hello. yes, yes, madam. Uh, sir. Yes, sir. You are seeing. Hello. Hello. Am I there? Yes, yes, uh, sir. You are there. Uh, we are uh, adding your presentation. Let me. Hello. I can see the screen now. Hello. Sir, please continue. Yes, sir, we can continue. So can you show me? Yeah. So can I see the slide now? Hello. Very sorry for this uh, inconvenience. Let me put my yeah. Okay. So I was talking about time and in this sensitivity. So why sensitivity increase? Okay, so the, the sensitivity increases because the peak becomes yeah. the bit of the peak is not. So the uh, the advantage is that the, the signal is very high compared to noise because the height is very high. So the noise ratio increases, and that is why sensitivity increases because of the UPLC. As the peak becomes very narrow and the height of the peak increases, UPLC's fast uh, resolving power uh, make it uh, analysis very quickly and quantifies and the compounds related or unrelated compounds can be quantified very easily. It can use uh, multi residue methods very fast, produces uh, process cycle time is very fast. One after the other, you can inject or high throughput analysis is possible. And more important thing is very less solvent consumption because the analysis gets over in very fast time. So the solvent consumption becomes very less. Uh, in pharmaceutical industry, the impurity profile is one of the major uh, problem. And many times you have to do this impurity profile analysis with uh, a UV detector. You may not have LCMS or LCMSMS which gives you high sensitivity and selectivity. So can you do many of these analysis with LC UV system, which is low cost, very stable, and whether you can achieve the kind of sensitivity by using the LC UV system even if you do not have LCMS system. So there are some ways of uh, working with it. One is that you can use the uh, 2D LC. So one thing is high sensitivity analysis of impurities by using the trap and concentrate the impurities in a trap and then allow them to go through UV detector. Otherwise use a 2D chromatogram or 2D HPLC which can uh, give you much better analysis. So use of uh, 1D or 2D analysis gives you much better uh, impurity profile without having LCM. So here I am showing you a 2D LC by using a trap. So you can see there is a small trap here at the bottom and uh, you can see the uh, impurity is uh, very very low. You can see the main peak is going out of scale and impurity is somewhere there. You cannot really uh, measure it uh, and quantify it at that stage. So what you can do is uh, you can take the sample at that point into a trap. It gets trapped in the uh, small trap which is kind of some adsorption or even uh, the column which is uh, by using a cartridge kind of a trap. And then after trapping it for some time you can then elute it and now you can see the peak, the target compound which can be very easily measured and you can very easily quantify it. So step one is that you uh, target the volume of injection and uh, do some kind of a rough separation. Step two is the uh, trapping or concentration through online dilution and then the, the trap concentration can be sent to the 
another column where you can achieve a good separation and good in, uh, detection of the impurity very easily. So here is the inline flow. So step one, where you are doing 1D separation, where you are able to see the chromatograms, there you have a detector. So you are carrying out a separation of the compounds. You are able to see the separation. So you have developed a method. Now, after doing that, the particular impurity has to be trapped. So what you can do in next step, you can make the sample pass through the trap. So you can see the sample is passing through the trap and the impurity is collected. Now you can repeat this injection multiple times. First detector can be used for analysis of rest of the thing while you are trapping the impurity in the trap for number of times. After that, this impurity which is trapped in the trap at the uh, column which is shown or the trap which is shown at the bottom and then now it, the things are passing so you have another mobile phase which is passing through the trap and through the column and now you are able to see this impurity very well so the separation and detection is possible so uh, now you can see uh, the kind of uh, analysis which is performed here so you can see the results uh, in the first case, if you directly do the analysis, you are not able to see the impurity at the time of that impurity retention time. If you assume that there is something and uh, try to uh, do it, it is absolutely wrong. You are getting RSD, which is very, very high. But then concentrating that impurity in the track for 15 times, injection, doing uh, the injection 15 times and concentrating that impurity in the track. Now you are able to see that impurity much better and RSD is only 1.2%. This is the actual example where in the 1D trap, so the impurity in ribriprazole is, uh, ribriprazole is measured in 1D, which you cannot see. And when you use the 2D, you are able to see the impurity much better. There are some application areas which are coming up very recently and one of the thing is uh, genotoxic impurity, especially for students. For industries, uh, these impurities are very much important. And there are a lot of uh, FDA regulations which are coming about genotoxic impurities in the drug products. And uh, these are the kind of uh, structural alerts which are published by FDA. So if your uh, uh, drug has any of these uh, kind of uh, structural uh, groups, there is a possibility that it can give you an impurity which could be genotoxic impurity. It can have a damage to the D, uh, I mean DNA or it can have uh, mutations and it can be carcinogenic. So the, uh, these impurities need to be analyzed. Okay, so uh, there are uh, and many a times these cannot be done by HPLC. You can develop a method if you are standard by using HPLC. But many times at very low level when they, they have to be analyzed. Now here, the limit is not 0.1%. It is much, much lower than that. And uh, these impurities then can be analyzed by using LCMS. Uh, there are a lot of analytical challenges, especially when you want to look at the toxicity of many of these compounds in the biological matrix. It becomes very, very challenging. And you require uh, to have the understanding of uh, the uh, uh, genotoxic impurities, uh, the, the nature of toxicity they can have and whether what kind of a toxicity level they have, whether they are really known as the carcinogenic compounds or they are maybe a sort of a compounds which could be carcinogenic. The, the studies have been completed or under process about its toxicity, etc. So you have to be very careful when you are doing work on these kind of toxic compounds. The new areas of toxicity is uh, nitrosamines. And these are the compounds. I mean, these are some of the drugs, generic names. And uh, these are the brand names. And these are the uh, things which have the compounds which are called as nitrosamines. And they are very, very toxic compounds. and Currently, there are a lot of methods which are getting developed on LCMS and DCMS for the analysis of nitrosamines in many of these drugs. There is another area of uh, importance which is uh, the which is the uh, uh, extractable leachable studies. 
and extractable leachable studies are uh, getting uh, more importance in uh, the uh, impurity analysis because the packaging material can contribute to some of the uh, toxicity to the drug products and uh, the term E and L, that is extractable and leachables. Uh, extractables are possible impact and leachables are actual impact. So that means extractable is the, uh, I mean, can be uh, studied for the, uh, for the material, which probably can give some kind of uh, compounds, which could be toxic, while leachables are already part of the drug products and you are trying to analyze them in the actual drug product. So leachable studies is done on the drug while extractable studies are done on the packaging materials or on the ink or on the labels or on the, uh, the entire thing which where the contribution can be because of the ink, contribution can be because of the glue, contribution can come because of the plastic material which can uh, contribute by uh, giving you phthalates and uh, uh, some kind of a uh, UV sensitive uh, kind of materials, which is like benzophenone and things like that. So these kind of extractable leachable studies are required to be done. Uh, so uh, there is, uh, uh, of course, requirement of a GCMS and LCMS. Some of the things can be also possible by uh, LC also. So these are some of the compounds which are listed here. There are some toxic elements also. And there are some compounds which are uh, uh, sort of a, uh, volatile compounds, semi-volatile compounds. Some of the compounds are not so volatile, which can be analyzed by HPLC, while some of the volatile compounds can be analyzed by GCMS and non-volatiles can be analyzed by GCMS. So uh, where we stand with respect to the uh, uh, HPLC instrumentation and applications, so the next generation of HPLC need to be self-starting, self-checking and self-authorizing to produce calibration data in built diagnostic should be able, uh, should be there and should be able to certify an instrument as fit for purpose and predict possible failure. People are moving towards that. So there are already HPLC systems, advanced HPLC systems which are available, which are doing part of the job. You can operate your machine through your mobile. Android and you can collect the data at any place uh, wherever you are even at home through your Android okay so you can control your HPLC from your home you can collect the data at your home and that is those kind of HPLCs are possible now and they can be self-starting so you can decide at what time you would like to start or you can start the system from your home or you can stop the system from your home if the work is over you can stop the system or if you want to start a system once the samples are loaded you can do that or you, you want to change the sequence of a sample you want a particular sample to be analyzed first before the other sample from whom you can give a command and you can analyze the sample which you want uh, on priority basis so those kind of uh, things have come up so the automation is really getting into self-diagnostic is possible of course as of today there are lot of difficulties in developing methods so there are some systems which uh, can put something like uh, seven eight uh, mobile phase uh, combinations on the uh, instrument and uh, you can uh, leave it to the instrument to develop a method by using uh, those uh, mobile phases which are available and uh, they will try to do it in absence for uh, the kind of sample which you have and try to give you the results next day uh, by using that punch line so the separation is not compromised but the time is definitely optimized okay so without compromising separation and optimizing time you can definitely get a good separation if there i mean there are some methods which are available but uh, the the chemist is definitely the, the person who has good knowledge on chromatography can develop a method much better much faster than any of these automatic systems well artificial intelligence is coming up and with that there is some kind of things which are possible in near future 
but many times it cannot overtake the natural intelligence. Uh, I will be quickly going through the LCMS. So uh, we know that chromatography gives you only one dimension on the basis of retention time. You try to say that this compound may be present, but that is not correct. I mean, there could be, as we have seen, the impurity can be a part of the major peak, and many times it gets missed because you do not know or you do not see the impurity uh, being present there. But when you have the mass spectrometer attached to that, you have the choice. You can get not only the retention time, you get the molecular weight information. And that is additional information which you can use to confirm the presence of a compound. This is not sufficient sometimes. So you can get the fragments. So by using MSMS, you can get the third dimension, which is fragments. And the, the fragments match with that of a standard uh, with respect to your any of your unknown compound. Then you can say that everything is matching retention time, molecular weight and fragments are matching. Then definitely I'm sure that this compound is present. So uh, this, that's the great advantage of mass spectrometry that it can definitely add the third dimensions to your uh, qualitative analysis plus it can give you much better quantitative analysis. This is the kind of a system uh, in short in the components of a mass spectrometer and the sample is introduced into the ionization chamber. The sample gets ionized and ions enter into mass analyzer. What mass analyzer requires is the sample in a vapor form and charged. So ions which are entering into mass analyzer should be in a vapor form and that creates a lot of problems in case of LCMS compared to GCMS because in case of GCMS sample is already in a vapor form and in case of LCMS you have to vaporize the sample and ionize it also and that created a lot of uh, uh, problems in uh, developing a method for LCMS or developing LCMS by itself it took very long time to develop LCMS. So uh, the Ionization techniques are different for volatiles. We have EI and TI for non volatiles. We have FAB and uh, GST, which are old, but currently we use atmospheric pressure ionization. API here doesn't stand for active pharmaceutical ingredients, it stands for atmospheric pressure ionization. And it is three of these ESI, APCI, and ATPI electro spray ionization, atmospheric pressure chemical ionization, or atmospheric pressure photoionization are used today for a good LCMS uh, analysis. These are the inventors of ESI and MARDI. MARDI is one of the important uh, techniques which is used uh, for analysis of uh, proteins and high molecular weight compounds by using the mass spectrometer. The structural elucidation, molecular weight information, etc. is possible because of MARDI. So you can uh, take the high molecular weight proteins into mass analyzer in a vapor form because of the MARDI source. And through LCMS, with electrospray ionization, one can definitely analyze the compound. So there are two scientists here. One on the extreme left is uh, John Fenn, who has invented electrospray ionization. And the central one is uh, Kuichi Tanaka, who has developed the MARDI source. And both of them are sitting to receive their Nobel Prize in 2002. Okay, so these two sites are very important and they have made uh, whatever uh, uh, mass spectrometry for all the non-volatiles feasible because otherwise in the initial stages people feel that the analysis of non-volatiles by LCMS is impossible but these two scientists made it possible at a very high sensitivity to a femtogram level also. This is the hardware flow for LCMS MS. So you can see I have shown here uh, two quadrupoles, and in between there is something called as a collision cell, which does the fragmentation and uh, which can give you a good mass spectra, uh, which will be able to give you the structural elucidation. I'm not going into details of this at the moment because of the time, but this is what is possible now. So analytical history, chromatography or liquid chromatography can go up to nanogram per ml, but with mass spectrometry and the hyphenated techniques, people have gone to centrogram level per ml or even autogram level per ml that is 10 to minus 18 of a gram. So the, the kind of a 
sensitivity which can be achieved now is much much better because of the development of a mass spectrometry. So uh, from liquid chromatography where you can go to nanogram, the femtogram or the autogram that is 10 raised to minus 18 compared to minus 9. So it is, you can see the kind of a jump from 10 raised to minus 9 to 10 raised to minus 18 which is possible because of the affination of the chromatography to mass spectrometry. Uh, so where we are going towards, okay, so future of biological research in health, food environment and for well-being of human life. Drug development is very, very important. Then nutraceutical development, diagnosis, new and high throughput methods for bioanalysis, development of new sample handling processes and bioprocesses and development of new biological methods. These are the areas where the things are moving. Omics is uh, going to come in a big way. We are already talking about genomics and proteomics, but metabolomics is going to come in a very big way, followed by transcriptomics and lipid lipidomics and peptidomics, and also metalomics, where you can look at the metal content in the biological fluids, especially in the blood and plasma. And uh, the, some of the metal ions are playing a very important role in. Uh, transmitting the signals and uh, all these are going to uh, be very very important in the near future so even metalomics is going to be very important in the near future uh, pharmacogenomics is coming in a big way and uh, uh, it's uh, a lot of people are studying gene drug interactions and genotyping can now be accomplished in 20 minutes and what is the ultimate goal? Ultimate goal of pharmacogenomics is to provide the right drug at the right dose for the right individual without any significant side effects. So uh, currently when we are using the drugs for uh, with the chemotherapy for cancer patients, we have a lot of after effects and uh, those kind of side effects can be avoided if you use a proper dosage proper uh, individual looking at its uh, capacity, its uh, metabolism, everything and giving the right dose so that the effects can be, side effects can be reduced. Well, uh, this is the statement given by Thomas Edison long back and he made a statement which may be coming into the force. Doctors of the future will give no medicine but will involve the patient in the proper use of food, fresh air and exercise. Of course, the, uh, the proper food and the fresh air, these are some of the things which are, um, which are uh, not possible with the kind of uh, industry growth which is going on and the food habits which we are inculcating. But at least uh, we can do some exercise to avoid uh, any kind of uh, uh, health issues and for that I think I will wish you all the best I wish you a good health and long life thank you so much hello yeah Any yes, questions? yes sir yeah. sir are you yeah. able to hear us yeah yeah I am able to hear yes please, yes please. Yeah. yes uh, so thank you so much, sir, uh, for this wonderful uh, session. And I must say that, sir, we were live on YouTube and uh, throughout the entire session, uh, there were questions pouring in from different participants. And yeah, okay. so thank you so much for giving us the insight, starting from the basics, the overview of the instrumentation of HPLC, how with the help of use of different detectors we are able to capitalize on analyzing different components though they are present in the mixture right from a multi by component multi component to a mixture of up to 40 components uh, then uh, sir has also very nicely explained as the varied applications of hplc when it comes to analyzing different impurities enrichment of impurities uh, using different uh, extraction procedures, step and three step methods, so that the impurities can be analyzed. Sir has also emphasized on uh, what is the role 
of uh, LCMS and how LCMS has evolved over the years when it comes to analyzing compounds right up to the pentogram level. And sir has uh, given us through his case study some examples on how both HPLC as well as LCMS can be used for multidisciplinary research when it comes to analyzing not only the small molecules as well as the large molecules. So thank you so much, sir. Uh, with your permission, we would now like to take a few questions which are put up by the participants. Please. So please. can we go ahead, sir? Please, please. I would welcome. Yes. So I uh, request the ICT team to please uh, put up the first question. So the first question is uh, uh, asked by one of the participants. Uh, the participant is asking that when we increase the flow rate or when we decrease the flow rate, what changes exactly peak area, the, the retention time? This question is asked by Ms. Vaibhavi. So generally, when you decrease the flow rate, definitely retention time will increase. And uh, what will happen because of that? The, the time taken for the analysis will definitely uh, increase. And again, depending upon the particle size, a decrease in flow rate will also affect your uh, uh, efficiency of the column. Especially when you have a uh, van diameter's curve which is showing the minimum and both the sides it is increasing compared to the linear velocity. So at optimum linear velocity you may get a good efficiency on your column. But either side of that optimum velocity you will find your efficiency of the column decreases. But when it comes to the molecules, which are, and when it comes to the particle size, which are sub 3 micron, you will find that the linear velocity uh, will not affect the column efficiency up to certain value. Of course, if you go on increasing the flow rate too much with small particle size, your, uh, the pressure will definitely increase. So you will cross your limit of uh, the uh, pump which is uh, generating the pressure. So there is of course a limit which is bound by the pump. But by using the higher flow rates. Routine QC uh, analysis. Few, yeah. Yeah. When it comes to routine QC analysis, what is better? HPLC or LCMS? Routine chemical analysis, if the sensitivities are not uh, very high. I mean, the detection limits are not very, very low. Then you can use a normal HPLC, which is much better compared to LCMS. LCMS requires a lot of uh, things uh, which need to be taken into consideration because LCMS is very, very sensitive. The the uh, mobile phase quality, the, the uh, sample preparation, uh, the impurities in your solvents which you are used for sample preparation, all those matter a lot. So you have to use a very high quality mobile phase and your sample preparation also has to be very good. Otherwise, no, as I said, the background will increase and my juggler says that background has to be low. So this has to be taken into consideration when you are using LCMS over LC. But for normal routine analysis, HPLC is good enough. Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Hello. Is there any problem? Hello. 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 Yes, sir. Uh, you are audible. Yeah. Uh, let me yeah, take please, up the sir. next question. Yeah, please, please. Yes, please. yes. Uh, so, but, uh, whether this whatever question... I have answered, is, is it okay for the question, uh, the person who has put the question? Y yes, yes, sir. Yeah, yes. Okay, let us assume that. Okay, bye. Next question, please. Yeah. This is by our uh, Dr. Supriya Shide that for impurity profiling analysis, using trap, why 15 injections are needed? Will it not require large amount of solvents? Yeah, these, uh, especially if the impurity is at the level of something like 0. 0.0001%, 
Now, normal HPLC will not be able to analyze the impurity which is uh, at such a low level, even with, I mean, with normal UV detector. Because the impurity is at very low level with 20 microliter your loop size, you will not be able to uh, analyze that impurity. So what needs to be done then, you have to concentrate that impurity. And by using the trap and in, uh, using multiple injections, uh, what you are doing is you are trapping that impurity into the trap number of times. So the amount of uh, level of impurity in the trap is much more now. Now you can take it to the uh, column which will be able to separate that impurity and the level of impurity being higher now, you will be able to see the peak which you can quantify. So when impurities are at very, very low level and you do not have a CMS with you, and which is of course very costly compared to having a 2D LC uh, sort of a thing which is comparatively cheaper. You will be able to do this kind of analysis a uh, much better way by using uh, trapping of the impurity. Okay. We are, we are talking about impurities which are something like four decimal or three decimals and then uh, 1%, 0.0001% level. 0.1% there should not be a problem by using normal HPLC, but if it is very low than that, you need to trap it. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, there are a few more questions, but due to crunch of time, we are not able to take up all the questions, but participants, your question. Yeah, one thing I can give you, I can, uh, you can share my, uh, this uh, email ID with the participants, our, uh, if you have any of... questions. Yeah, yeah. Then uh, they can. Yeah, so there to... are a few more questions, but due to time crunch, yeah, we are not I able to understand. take up the questions. I can understand that. So you yes, can share yes. my uh, email ID with them, and if they want to sure. put a question across, any of can... the participants have right. also requested Sir's PPT. So all of you yeah. can subscribe to our college YouTube channel. Sir's uh, session will be yeah. available on our college YouTube channel, so you can uh, have a look at the notes uh, through his PPT by viewing the channel so sir now i would like to uh, request uh, dr mushtaq sheikh uh, the head of uh, pharmaceutical chemistry department at vs college of pharmacy to propose the vote of thanks so over to you mushtaq sir uh, let me confirm am I audible yes you are audible yes yes you are audible yeah uh, thank you very much for organizing team for giving me the opportunity to present the vote of thanks I will start uh, my vote of thanks with uh, thanking the management of VS College of Pharmacy and Board of Trustee members. Uh, to be very precise, Shri Bulani Ji and Professor Charnadas Madam, who had been uh, very helpful as well as motivating the entire team to go uh, and meet new people and do all sort of new activities for our students as well as students around us, right? And that's I hope that our this uh, approach and uh, intention has been fulfilled by this session also. Uh, nextly, I would like to really thank uh, our principal madam who had been backbone of uh, this kind of activities and building up a quality, bringing a quality in the educational sector for uh, pharmacy education in particular. Uh, our guest, uh, Dr. Ajit sir uh, from Clarity Biosystem India Private Limited, Shumas Radical from India Private Limited. I'm very thankful to sir for accepting our invitation just on a single call and delivering this uh, meticulous session with uh, such a nice deliberation. I would congratulate the organization team, Dr. Anita Madam, the ICT team, and Miss Plug for uh, handling this session so nicely. Uh, last, uh, last but not least, I would like to thank the audiences for patient listening and putting such uh, uh, intricate questions, inquisitive questions, and getting them resolved. I'm sure that sir will also respond the queries uh, which they will receive. Uh, just to summarize that sir has given the background, the application area, the case studies, the advancement, particularly 2D LC and uh, trapping the impurity technique and even the automation part was something new for me. And a student, I will always uh, uh, say that whatever uh, you have to mind that what takeaway you are taking. So from this session, what I am taking the takeaway, that interpretation is also important, very, very important. Just data creation is not the everything. So interpretation survey had put uh, some light on this uh, section also. So uh, such kind of session will keep coming from our side. Keep watching our channel. 
So uh, this thing, uh, research connect series, we are taking very nicely this year also. So next week also some sessions are planned. We will also share the details shortly uh, with you all. Thank you very much, everybody. And keep listening to this channel.